Can we pull back, historically speaking, and in terms of the big picture of cryptocurrency real quick, mm -hmm. and ask the question, what is Cardano? We started talking about already the consensus algorithm Cardano takes, but maybe when you look at the history books, you know, sort of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Cardano will have one sentence. Uh, what's that one sentence going to be? And in general, what's like the vision in the context of the history of cryptocurrency, you have like this whiteboard overview video that mm -hmm. you uh, talk about the three generations of cryptocurrency where Cardano is the third. So that's uh, like five different questions, way of asking the exact same thing you can answer however the hell you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Car I always term Cardano as like a FOSS, a financial operating system, and nobody likes it and everybody picks on me for using that term. But basically the idea is that, you know, the world runs on systems, especially the financial world. You have, you know, the BIS and SWIFT and all this other stuff. And, it, and these protocols allow you to move value around and represent things like identity and uh, and allow you to express yourself in some way. And those protocols, for the most part, work well for people in rich countries. And they don't work so well for people who aren't in rich countries. And so the point of what we do, or at least what I do and what my company does, is we, we think a lot about how do we build a universal protocol that does all the stuff the legacy system has, but just does it better, faster, and cheaper for all, everybody in the world. And everybody has equal access to it. You know, So it's the people's protocol. You, know, you have a situation where the guy in Senegal has the same access that I do, or Bill Gates does, or someone else who's kind of higher on the, uh, the spectrum of wealth and power. And so uh, that is what we seek to achieve. But then the question is, well, is Cardano the solution? You know, is, it that, is that that thing? And the answer is no, because you need a lot more evolution. You need decades of evolution to kind of work your way there. And in many ways, the work is never quite done, but it's better than what came before. Why? Because you, you have a realization that first, the control of the system needs to be more balanced and nuanced, and it needs to be more democratic. So there's this sustainability component of like who's in charge and how do you pay for things? Well, the system can print its own money, so it always has the ability to have a budget. Okay, so there's a treasury idea. And then there's a voting thing. Well, the same things that allow you to move money around allow you to represent votes. So you can do e-voting with the type of system, okay? And you know, if you played Nomic in the 1980s or Peter Superfan or any of these things, you can build a self-evolving system. You can actually create a game where the rules can be voted on and changed in the game itself. Great. Okay, so that exists there. And then you say, okay, well, but this thing still has to touch the legacy world. There has to be cash in and cash out and these types of things. So this is this interoperability thing. That you need a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth moment for the industry because nothing understands each other right now. There are all these chains that are blind, deaf, and dumb to each other. And then there's this thing that it has to work at a huge scale. Yeah. Like billions of people. And we've done that, but we've done that with large multinational trillion dollar companies with centralized infrastructure. We've never really done that with one master protocol that somehow does it for everyone. The closest approximation is probably BitTorrent. And there is, you know, there was, it's a cool protocol, but it doesn't have all the oomph necessary to, necessary to do something like this. So Cardano is just our first approximation. And like any good system, it's, it, we wanted it to be self-evolving. So once you get the philosophy out of where's the target of what do you want to do, then you build a community. Now it's over a million people strong. And that community keeps growing and they keep pushing the system in that particular direction. And what's nice about it is if you build the right philosophy within the system, it doesn't need founders. This is the great lesson of Satoshi. It doesn't need founders to be able to get there. So, uh, you know, if you look at the academic side, that's very decentralized. We have more than 30 different contributors for the 105 papers, and that set keeps growing. Within the next five years, it'll probably be two, three, 400 different scientists from all across the world, some from Russia and some from India, some from China and some from Japan and America and Africa and South America. And the faces change, the languages change, the cultures change, but the process stays the same. And that is a permanent organ within what we have constructed as a system. And it's the same situation entering marketplaces. Like we entered Ethiopia. What are we doing there? We have 5 million people in Ethiopia. We're getting them digital identity and we're dragging that digital identity into the system because that's the most fundamental thing of a financial operating system. You need to know who people are in order to be able to do business with them, give them credit, be able to give them economic agency and sort of thing. But once they're there, they're going to grow up with that system. 
They're going to deploy applications on that system. They're going to build on that system. They're going to use it every day for getting a loan or payments and so forth. And if they have pain points, what they're going to do is evolve that system to be able to mitigate and manage those particular pain points mm -hmm. to a point where the system is competitive for it. So my job is to be, we have this tagline in our company, cascading disruption. Our, my job is to be the first domino. Just kind of knock it over and watch the cascade. Mm -hmm. And it kind of blows and blows and blows up until eventually uh, you know, it gets to where we need to go. And what I was trying to think about with Cardano was how do you build the minimum viable set of tools and social processes that once we push the domino, the system will just evolve to a point where eventually it can grow to fill that need, not out of charity, but out of self-interest. Right. People want things better, faster, cheaper. You know, people want to have economic agency, especially when they lack it. Nobody wants to grow up in a world where they're unbanked and they have no access to marketplaces. They're gonna seek it. Look at M-Pesa, it's the great example of that, like cell phone minutes they're using as a currency. So uh, that's where we're at. And I say a few more years, I think we'll have th that right minimum viable set of dynamics inside the system. And then it's inevitable, in my view, that it'll kind of grow and consume and become this concept. And what's really cool is there's competition in the systems and concepts. So China is trying to do the same thing. They're saying, how do we de-dollarize the world and create a digital yuan? So they have a very top-down notion of how to apply this technology and bring it in. And they even have an identity system they're building in parallel called social credit. We have an identity system, a Tala Prism, that we're putting in. Ours is bottom up and you own your own identity, social credit, you have no idea. You just have a number and some computer's giving mm -hmm. it to you, but they're both trying to do the exact same thing. And it's gonna be this clash of cultures at some point between the open fosses and the top-down authoritarian fosses and mm -hmm. probably some Hegelian dialectic action will happen. <laughs> we'll create you know, some sort of somewhat closed, somewhat authoritarian, libertarian utopia. Yeah, no, most likely it would be AIs battling in the space of fossils. So I really like this idea of financial operating system, but what this, the letter F, so financial, is this just um, a basic mechanism with which you can have social interaction, therefore, therefore, or all kinds of interactions, therefore have an identity? Like, is F essential to this? Yeah, because it, that's how people care. You need resources to survive. And, okay. you know, finances is kind of like this field of, of managing your resources in an intelligent way. And you could call it SOFI too, social finance. You know, the, 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 the nomenclature hasn't exactly been settled for our industry, and that's fun. But basically the concept <laughs> is that you, you, you have something and you want to be able to store it, transform it, trade it, and use it to survive. Uh, and the question is, what rails do you do that on? Do you do those on centralized, controlled rails where there are these uh, third parties that are, you know, basically able to to live off those things, become very fat and nepotistic, or do you want to do it on rails where there's no middleman? You have a direct relationship with whoever you're doing business, and if you invite more people to the transaction, they're middlemen of value, not necessity. Mm -hmm. And that's really the the I would like to say the raison d'etre of our our space. That the reason we exist is to try to figure out a way to kill the middleman and try to figure out a way that we can better quantify value and transform it, move it, manipulate it. And in many ways, we've actually discovered some amazing things in the last 10 years as an industry. Like we've kind of created the financial stem cell. This idea of a token can now is just as well be a national currency as a CBDC as it can represent a crypto kitty. You know, the same architecture can do stuff at the nation scale, can do stuff for a 12-year-old kid in Texas. It's pretty amazing to see that.